Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Senate Education. It's Friday, January 7th, 1.30. We are going to return to a topic that we spent a, quite a bit of time on last year or some time on last year, and that is the um, some of the issues that uh, the state, the country is dealing with around uh, public dollars flowing to religious institutions. And we know that there are there is one Supreme Court case um, there are other multiple state level cases and federal cases happening around the country where uh, individuals in the courts are trying to best understand uh, what some people would consider a, a line between church and state. And we've asked uh, Jim Demeray and Beth St. James to come in today, to give us a little presentation to bring us back to, to the issue um, there are, as we'll learn um, when we're discussing the situation, different ways to handle this situation, um, one of which is to, to wait for the courts. But uh, there are, of course, I put in up just a, an idea, a bill based on some of the conversations we had last year that might get us started. And I think there are other ideas out there that some of you may have and uh, different members of our constituencies might have. So. Um, this is something that uh, Jim is certainly is very familiar with. So I'll turn it over to you now, Jim, you and Beth for your presentation, unless I see questions or any other initial comments from committee members. Senator Persley. Okay, just so you know me. Okay, great. Jim, Beth, thanks for joining us. Okay, uh, so for the record, uh, Jim Damray, that's council. Can you hear me? A uh, little better now, but it's still not great. How's that? How's that? Uh, beautiful. Great. Okay. Okay. So um, we have a PowerPoint presentation to go through. And uh, Chair uh, Campion, would you like to have that shared on screen or, or not? Sure. That'd be great. Okay. And we also, uh, does Daphne have copies of it? She does, yep. Okay, great, so it's sure. on our uh, website, presumably. Let's share this. Okay, that's too far along. Okay, so um, can people see this? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, we're talking uh, today about the constitutional issues that surround the um, use of public tuition for um, independent religious schools. Um, and um, we're gonna talk about today four topics. The first uh, is when are religious schools entitled to public tuition? Second, are religious, school, are religious schools places of public accommodation? And therefore, if they are, uh, they would not be allowed to discriminate against protected classes. And protected classes means race, gender, uh, sex, sex, et cetera. Um, third topic is, can Vermont require that religious schools comply with anti-discrimination laws as a condition of receiving public tuition? And the fourth topic is, um, what about dual enrollment? How does that fit in? I'll take the first and last topics, and Beth will take the middle two. So, um, so the first topic is, uh, when are religious schools entitled to public tuition? Um, so the US Constitution, uh, the First Amendment, has the free exercise clause which says that Congress shall make no law, law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Uh, and that's what we, we'll be talking about this primarily through this presentation. What does that mean? Um, the relevant case here came in 2020, uh, Espinosa v. Montana, um, where the Supreme Court um, decided this case um, and the facts there were that 
uh, Montana provide tax benefits to individuals who donated money for private school scholarships, but prohibited families from using that scholarships at religious schools. So this isn't exactly our fact pattern of, of, um, of tuition towns paying tuition, but it's similar in that this is a tax benefit encouraging private school scholarships, but not for uh, religious schools. Uh, the prohibition uh, from Montana was based on its constitution, which bars government aid to any school controlled by any, any church. It is a so-called no aid provision. I'll come back to this, um, but this constitutional provision is in over half, I believe, of state constitutions. Uh, not Vermont, but uh, it's, it's a common provision in other states', states constitutions. Um, and the court held that Montana's no aid provision violates the free exercise clause because it bars religious schools from public benefits solely because of the religious character of the school of its schools. So what the court held is that a state need not, not subsidize private education, but once the state decides to do so, it cannot disqualify some private schools solely because they are religious. Um, the case stands for the proposition that a religious school cannot be denied a public, public benefit merely because of the school status as a religious school if the benefit is available broadly to others. So it's, in this case, it's, it's available to secular schools. And the use of that benefit is directed by individuals as a result of their own genuine and independent private choice. So if those two conditions are met, broadly available benefit, directed by individuals, then you can't deny that benefit to a religious school based on its status. Uh, the court left open the question of whether a state could, instead of prohibiting public tuition going to a religious school, um, left open the question of whether um, that funding could be allowed on the condition that the school ensures that public tuition is not used for religious instruction. I'm going to pause here for one second to draw out the fact that this sets up a, well, I'll call a status versus a use um, division line here. So Espinoza involved improper, improperly disadvantaging, disadvantaging religious schools based on their status. That's clear. You can't do that. The question that's left open is, is if a state We'll come to Vermont, but Vermont does this. If a state has, has a rule that says you can use tuition for a religious school, but uh, there has to be safeguards against its use for religious worship, that question, the court did not decide. Um, the other thing before I move on, I'll say it's about the no A provisions here, which I mentioned uh, on the previous slide. These no A provisions came about in the 1800s when uh, a con congressman uh, named Blaine from Maine um, tried to get the US Constitution amended uh, with this provision. And his, the idea behind that was um, to disadvantage Catholics. So the whole kind of no aid, that didn't happen at the US constitutional level, um, but that prompted many states to adopt that very same approach and uh, prohibit aid to any, any school controlled by a church. Um, and the court talked quite a bit in Espinosa about that background, about the fact that the, the no way provision that it, it's basically striking down here in this context came out of a bias against Catholics. Was, it was important historical background, or seemed to be in this case. I mention that now because it's relevant uh, when I come on to a case in, in a few minutes um, that's relevant to Vermont. Okay, so moving on from, from this, this topic here, and moving over to talk about um, 
Vermont. So uh, Vermont's constitution has a provision uh, called the Compelled Support Clause, which says that no person can be compelled to support any place of worship contrary to the dictates of conscience. So it's not a no aid provision. It doesn't say that we can't, can't use money uh, at all. Um, uh, um, but it does say that you can't use government money to support a place of worship. So a bit different than the new aid provisions. Um, this this um, came up in 1999 in the Chittenden v. Department of Education case uh, where the Vermont Supreme Court held that a school district violates the compelled support clause when it pays public tuition to a religious school in the absence of adequate safeguards against the use of such funds for religi religious worship or instruction. So um, in conclusion, uh, Vermont's constitution allows public tuition to go to religious schools and therefore does not allow discrimination based on the school status, but there has to be safeguards to ensure funds are not used for religious, religious instruction. Um, uh, will Chittenden survive es Espinoza? Um, currently, Vermont's constitution, as interp interpreted by Chittenden, is consistent with Espinoza. And that they both permit public tuition to go to a religious school and do not allow discrimination based on the status of the school. However, the Vermont Constitution requires safeguards against the use of public funds for religious instruction. It's not clear whether this use condition will survive further Supreme Court scrutiny. Any questions before I go on? Anybody, anybody have any questions, feel free to uh, shout them out. Uh, Senator Perslick, do you have a question? Who was the Chittenden in the Chittenden? Was the Chittenden School District? I'm assuming it was Tom. It was it was Chittenden Town. Town. So it was down by Rutland. <laughs> yeah. In that case, the Chittenden Town is a tuition town, and they wanted to send their students to Mount St. Joseph's, I believe, in Rutland. Yeah. Yeah. So. I may chair. Please. So I don't want to. Uh, Sorry. Can I just get a uh, oh, Senator oh, Chittenden? Um, uh, was, go ahead, was, Senator Chittenden. Go ahead. I don't want to steal your thunder from where you're going with this, Jim, but if I recall correctly from Professor Teachout's presentation, he introduced the other concept of not necessarily discriminating or delineating on religious instruction, but instead on discriminatory instruction. Is that where you're going to be presenting as the distinction between the two? Um, he was talking, we were talking last year. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute so I can see you. Sure. Um, we uh, last year we were talking about um, two certifications, um, and one was a certification that would um, have the school, whether it's secular or sectarian, either have the school um, certify that it won't use the funds for uh, religious instruction, and then um, secondly. There was an additional certification we talked about last year that would have them certify that they will comply with all uh, anti-discrimination laws that apply to public schools, right? And that's where that one comes in. We'll talk about, we'll get there in terms of, we're not talking right now about the bill or the options. We're going to the background, but I'm sure we'll get to talking about those other, other points. Senator Hooker. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so just explain to me again the the quote from the Constitution that says no person can be compelled to support any place of worship contrary to the dictates of conscience. Right. Individual conscience, how do you determine that as far as, you know, taxpayer dollars? If one person is, is opposed to it, does that mean that, you know, it shouldn't be used? I mean, how does that play out? Because it's then... You know, then you talk about the money being used for a, a religious school, but not being used for purposes of religious um, instruction. Yeah. So the way the court looked at that in Chittenden, the Vermont Supreme Court, 
was to say, look, um, the compelled support clause essentially means that tax dollars should not be going uh, to support with this, this instructional worship. Um, because using tax dollars that way would violate, if I'm against that as a taxpayer, would violate my conscience, if you will. So the court looked at, at that way and, and basically said, um, you can use this, these funds, these, this, these public funds for private religious schools, that's okay in principle, but you they have to not use them for worship, uh, right? Or, or, or instruction uh, of for relig relig religious pur purposes. So that's how the court came down on that question. Senator Hooker, did that answer your question? Okay. Uh, Senator Terenzini? Yes. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Senator Kimmy. I, I think my question has been somewhat answered, but I just want to give you a scenario. So if, if, if say, my wife and I decided we wanted to send our kids instead of sending them to the Rutland Town School where they go now, if we decided we wanted to send them next year to Christ the King Elementary School here in Rutland, we could do so using uh, public dollars but Christ the King would have to somehow sign a document or, or somehow prove to the state that those tax dollars were not going to pay for catechism or Bible class, right? Yep. Uh, there has to be some safeguards. Uh, and the, the process that was discussed last year was the certification process. So <clears throat> I guess I asked the question, and I know that we talked about this somewhat last um, session, Senator King, but what are... I guess what are, what are what are we trying to accomplish here? In other words, it seems like there are safeguards in place. It seems like for those who want to take advantage of it, they could. What what are we trying to accomplish here? Well, I'll come on to it on my slides. But since 1999, when Chittenden was decided, well, let me back up. Um, in terms of of paying tuition, that decision is made by school districts and their boards. Okay, so a parent. Uh, in a tuition town would go to its school board and say, I'd like to go to this school, independent school. And the, um, the district, therefore, has to decide whether that's permissible or not. Since 1999, when it was decided, there's been no meaningful guidance given to school districts as to how to ensure safeguards are in place. Uh, there's been nothing from the legislature, nothing from the state board, nothing from the AOE. AOE gave guidance for a few minutes and then withdrew it. So they gave some guidance, but it didn't stick. So there's been no guidance. Um, not that there has to be. I mean, school districts could just like figure it out, right? But there's been no guidance. And school districts have been very uneven in this practice. So some of us have said, said, no, you can't, we can't, you can't go. This is religious school. Some of them have paid. And now uh, under various court cases are being forced to pay, even though um, that forced payment um, is not consistent with Chittenden because now we've got court cases where the US courts are saying, under Espinoza, you have to pay this money uh, because you've been screaming based on SAS, but there are no safeguards being put in place to ensure that in the future there won't be it won't be used for that purpose. Can I ask so, you a yeah. So, uh, so I could go potentially, and I don't know how my school district would handle it, but I could potentially go to my school district and say, okay, I want to send my kids to Christ the King next year. They would have the, uh, in their opinion, potentially, they would have the right to say yes, okay, we'll pay for it, or no, we're not going to. And if they denied me, that could be potentially a violation of my Vermont constitutional right. If they denies you, uh, it could be uh, it was a denial based upon the status of the school. Um, yeah, and that's what the cases have been about in Vermont. And there have been a number of cases in Vermont on this very topic. But may I just interject here? Would Senator Terenzini have to live in a choice town in other, you know, to take advantage of this? Or could he live in any town? I was I was under the assumption that if Senator Terenzini, you know, right now has the choice to send 
you know, to two or three schools, one of which could be this, the Christ, the King. Yeah. So Vermont's interesting. So, um, and this is, this is very relevant to uh, going forward. Vermont system, of course, is to, as a system to say, if you don't operate schools, then you tuition your kids using public right. tuition, right? But if you operate schools in Vermont, you can't just take your kid and, and give them a voucher and have them go someplace else. So we don't have school vouchers the way most states do. Most states have vouchers that apply to kids going to operating schools to give them a choice between operating. And we are only given that choice as a system to, to districts that don't operate schools. So we have a very unique history here uh, behind how we do things in Vermont, uh, which I'll come on to because it might be relevant to a future case, if you will. Look at but that could Senator Terrence, that's, that's, so could he, if he's not, if he has a local public school right there, yeah. can he, is it, under the current situation, can anybody in any town say, I'm going to leave and take my dollars and go to Christ the King or St. Joseph's, or is it just in communities that don't offer a public school option? It is, it's a yes and no answer. The yes okay. part of the answer is as a system that's true, it's only for tuition towns, as a system. Right. Everybody in a tuition town gets this benefit. Yeah, yeah. But however, if you're in an operating district, Yep. Um, and if, for example, um, uh, the school that you're going to just offer certain programs or sports, or whatever, uh, you can petition your school board on an exceptional basis to go to another school using public tuition. It's fully at the, of the, of the discretion of the school board to decide. Um, it, it's not a wide school choice thing. It's just a very narrow thing. Uh, but there are some limited circumstances in operating districts where tuition can be used as well. So Senator Terenzini had, I just want to play this out a little bit more. If he is not in a, um, if he is in an operating district and he just, his daughter really wants to play lacrosse, the local school doesn't have it. He can petition the school board to say, listen, this has become a real priority for her. She loves it. I yeah. want her to go to uh, to the public school, you know, that the uh, Mount Anthony Union High School yeah. that has a great look. So it's it's for all different kinds of reasons. The school board could say, yeah, that makes sense. Or they could say, no, you guys are going to stay put right here. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Senator Terenzini, do you have a follow up? Um, no, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I appreciate the line of questioning, uh, Senator Campion. I, I, I think I'll use, once again, my municipality, for an example, we have Rutland Town School. We have a school within our within our four walls of our, of our town, but we're ascending high school. We don't have a high school, so we, we have to right. tuition out. So I could have went to Rutland, Proctor, West Rutland, wherever. Um, and at the time, there was not, uh, it was not well known when I was in high school, I don't believe, that um, I could have went to MSJ, Mount St. Joseph in Rutland, and use taxpayer dollars for it. So I think right. in our scenario in Rutland Town, my kids would have to go to Rutland Town School. And then for high school, that's when I could, if I had chosen, yeah. or if I choose to, I could then uh, petition my school board to say, I want my kids to go to this Catholic school yeah. for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, is there a bill number, Senator Campion, I'm missing attached to this? I, I just put a bill in today that, uh, it's not really, I'd say, a ta this is all background information, but <coughs> a bill that's going to be coming to us that tries to, again, back to your initial question to me, which is, what are the goals? I would say, uh, do we have a majority of people in the Senate or in this committee that want to take steps that would make sure that schools that are taking public dollars aren't discriminatory, number one. If so, we want to put some guidelines around those. And is there a majority in the Senate and in this committee that would want to make certain that public tax dollars aren't going to uh, religious instruction? In other words, putting some guidelines around how dollars could be used. So if, you, so if a family were to take the dollars and go to Mount St. Joseph's, 
Although I would admit it would be a very hard thing to do, but to have them certify that they're going to use those dollars for the, you know, math, science, French, German, whatever, um, and not for if there were a daily church service or for religious instruction, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't know if there is a majority on the committee or in the Senate that would, would want to take those, those two steps. The other piece of it is, I think there are districts out there that are kind of uncertain as to what they're going, what they can be and what they should be doing. And, and so the third piece of it would be some clarification. I don't know, is there some, some, some clarification that we need to give districts right now? So those are the, I'd say for me, the, the way I'm approaching this um, and uh, giving committee members and colleagues those options. And what I put in was, was based on some of the, some of what I just talked about and some of what we talked about a little bit last year um, as, a, as a way to get some of this conversation going. Jim, am I missing anything? Nope, nope, that bill is being set up for an introduction. So we'll be ready to go next week if you wanna yeah. talk about it then. Should go Senator, back to the- Do you have a follow-up? No, you're okay. Senator Lyons, did you have a question? No, okay. Jim, okay, and we'll go back to uh, the presentation. Um, we go here. Is, okay. Okay. So we talked about whether Chitin do more survive Espinoza. Um, we don't know because we don't know the court's view of this use distinction. Um, however, um, next slide talks about um, this main case, um, which is very relevant to Vermont. So. Um, this is a case of Carson B. Macon. Jim, before uh, you do that, may I just go back to, to one other thing? Yeah. You mentioned in the decision that the courts have been referring to, uh, I think he was Senator Blaine at that point, U.S. Senator Blaine from Maine, his attempts to uh, prohibit public dollars going to, particularly to, to Catholic institutions. I mean, it was a time in this country where I think you had a lot of Irish, Italian, uh, other immigrants that were coming in, bringing Catholicism, and there was, a, I think, a threat, I know, in New England. People saw it as a threat to their sort of New England ways, et cetera, and whether or not, uh, in some ways, the, the Pope would take over. Tell me a little bit about why the courts are referring to that period of time and Blaine's attempts, even though his attempts weren't successful. <sighs> I'm not sure why, to be okay. honest with you. I can I can tell you that um, the Espinosa's opinion took a, a few pages, I think, to talk about the background of the Blaine Amendments. And basically to say, um, to, to the extent you're relying on the no aid amendments to deny a benefit to um, religious organizations, um, the, the courts just seem to be somewhat informed by the history of those amendments coming out of an anti-religious sentiment. sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and it's relevant too because um, the court found basically in that case um, for, the, for the school, right? They found for the school. Um, the main case which we're about to discuss finds the opposite, finds, makes a finding um, uh, contrary to Espinoza um, and based on the history of Maine's uh, statutes, uh, constitution. So let me talk about that now because it might be help inform okay. your, your answer. Um, so this case here, Macon, um, 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 was decided in uh, 2020 by the First Circuit Court of Appeals and has been appealed to the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court heard the appeal in January of this year, and we expect a decision by this summer. And the case is, um, like Vermont, Maine allows towns that do not operate schools to use public funds to pay tuition to independent schools. So this is directly on point to what we do here. Um, and according to the court in Macon, uh, Maine, Maine allows public funds for religious school tuition, but prohibits these funds from being used for religious instruction. So 
the main system, if you will, is similar to the Vermont system, and it makes this use distinction. So it says you can use the funds, you can, funds can go to these um, religious schools, but they can't be used for uh, religious instruction. So it's very similar to Vermont in that way as well. And the first court, First Circuit Court of Appeals held that this system, main system, did not violate the exercise clause, and that it was consistent with Espinoza because it imposed a permissible use restriction. Um, so what, what that tells us is that um, we don't know today whether um, this use versus status distinction is going to be upheld. We do know that it was upheld in this case. This use restriction was upheld in this First Circuit opinion, which we decided with the Supreme Court this summer. So in terms of certifying, um, requiring uh, schools of Vermont to certify that they won't use the funds for religious instruction, if you do that, then there's a possibility the court will decide this summer that use distinction is irrelevant, and therefore um, that certification is, is not valid. In other words, if it goes that way, the court would, would basically, the rule would be that um, whether your restriction is based on SAS or use, you have to pay, you have to use public tuition if that benefit's made available to, sec, uh, to, um, to secular school, schools. Um, as well. So may so, I just, uh, just for everyone's, I've been living a little bit of this this summer, so I just want to make sure everyone's clear and make sure I'm clear. So Jim, you're saying, for example, uh, if we were to go forward, as I just discussed, and pass a bill that would put restrictions around how dollars can be used when they go flow to religious schools, um, that the court very well may in this June come out and say, hey, sorry, putting even restrictions around those dollars um, uh, aren't, isn't going to be allowed going forward. It would basically allow for more of a flow for uh, dollars to go to religious schools, whether or not, how, with no restriction on how those dollars could be used. Correct, yep, correct, yep. yep. And what about the anti-discrimination piece related to it? So. Uh, we That's know that coming there... next. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Senator Shaden. Uh, never mind if it's coming next. I'll wait till then. Okay. Okay. So we're not talking about discrimination yet. We're only talking about use versus status at this stage. Um, I do want to talk a bit about the history of Maine because the court and this decision spent quite a bit of time too talking about Maine's history in that just like Vermont because of its um, being a very rural state many districts did not operate schools and essentially used independent schools as a substitute for public schools. So that decision in Carson, the Macon, it was interesting they, they talked quite a bit about that and kind of therefore saying, it makes sense that you wouldn't want your school to, um, to provide religious instruction because mm -hmm. you're trying to make it like a public school. It's only because you don't operate schools you have the system to begin with. You're trying to get to a point as a state where basically it's an option for public education. And that's true for Vermont too. So I'm not sure how much these histories matter, but they were quite uh, discussed in both these cases, Carson and Espinoza, with different results. Um, so just to mention that Vermont history here is lined up with this, this main, main case as well. So last slide for me before I move on to Beth, talk about discrimination, is recent Vermont cases. We've had a number of Vermont cases and administrative proceedings at the uh, State Board of Education that have recently found that public tuition payments were, de were denied to these schools because of their status in violation of Espinoza. And this, those um, decisions have ordered these payments to be made. Um, in these cases, the evidence showed that the school districts denied these tuition payments due to the school status, not based upon their proposed use. So it's kind of an easy decision to make based on Espinoza. Um, 
as I mentioned, school districts have been given no guidance on this. Um, so they're kind of left on their own. And right now they're in the uncomfortable position of being ordered by your court to make these payments. But in doing so, they're likely violating the Vermont Constitution as interpreted by Chittenden because they're not getting any assurance that these schools aren't using the funds for religious instruction. So it's putting the districts in an uncomfortable position. So um, I'll pause there. I'm going to turn over to Beth. And before I do so, are there any questions for me on this first question? Any questions at this yeah. point? Senator Lyons, do you have a question? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. No? Okay. Okay. So, so I'll run the slides for Beth. Um, okay. That's okay for Beth. Um, and the question I'll leave for Beth right here. Pressure's on, Beth. This is your first presentation before us. It is. Thank you for reminding me of that pressure. I appreciate it. Um, uh, for the record, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, so the next question, um, and I think the less uh, decided area of the law, although none of this is very decided, as you can tell, um, is are religious schools places of public accommodation and therefore not allowed to discriminate against protected classes? I'm gonna avoid saying next slide, please, Jim. So What's that? Um, I'm gonna try and avoid having to say next slide, yep, please. I was just, yep. <laughs> Thank you. So the Vermont Public Accommodations Act is found in chapter uh, or in title nine, and it states, uh, it prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, creed, color, national origin, marital status, sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity. To make it easy, we could just call them the protected classes um, in places of public accommodation. And so what is a public, what is a place of public accommodation? Vermont law defines a place of public accommodation as any school, restaurant, store, establishment, or other facility at which services, facilities, goods, privileges, advantages, benefits, or accommodations are offered to the general public. So there's some uh, buzzwords in here. So the first one is school. This is the definition. The type of school or what, encompass, what is encompassed in that term is, is not clearly defined. It just says school. Um, but then we look at the very end of that definition and it's clear that those um, categories of places need to be offered to the general public to qualify uh, as a place of public accommodation. So if a religious school was considered a place of public accommodation under the Vermont Public Accommodations Act, they would be automatically prohibited from um, discriminating against those protected classes. Um, so the real question is, is a religious school considered a place of public accommodation in Vermont? And so uh, there I'm is- sorry, Senator Hooker, did you have a question? Did you, uh, do you mind? Uh, I do, Beth, we just I, I do. thank you. And thank you, Beth. Um, you've listed a number of things that to be considered public, uh, the facility has to offer. All of them? Some of them? Um, Jim, can you go back to that slide? I'm sorry. Yeah. Just the definition. Um, I'm sorry, Senator Hooker. Do you mean are all of those categories considered public accommodations? No. Do, does the uh, facility have to offer all of those categories or just? No, 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 no. Those categories are... Um, no, I can't. That's a great question. I can't think of one that does. Um, it would just be a school, a standalone school. So uh, public schools, because they offer their services to the public, are considered um, a place of public accommodation. Um, but, but if a religious school offered uh, facilities, for instance, it's a for great question to rent, then are they considered public accommodations? Uh, I don't. That answer is still, that's not a settled area of law. And I will address that a little bit in a, in a later slide, but it's an excellent question because um, I'll, a little spoiler alert, 
it's going to come uh, whether or not a, a religious school is considered a place of public accommodation would most likely come down to a fact based analysis. And so some of the case law that addresses what is a place of public accommodation, and there is no Vermont case directly on point in relation to a religious school. There are cases that are related to private, what would, uh, places that would consider themselves private organizations and discussing the extent to which um, a um, organization that thinks it's private holds any sort of services open to the public on kind of a um, side business, like a bingo hall or something like that is a part of that analysis. Um, there, uh, it, you know, if a, um, if a religious organization were to set up um, a lemonade stand um, in front of Hannaford, um, they wouldn't be allowed to discriminate there just because they're a religious organization. They're, you know, in, on a public sidewalk in front of a public grocery store offering lemonade stand to the general public. So it's not an incredibly straightforward analysis, but that is um, certainly a factor that a court could look at. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And I, I'm just thinking, you, you mentioned bingo. So many schools, including religious schools, hold bingo nights when anybody can go. What about, uh, if you wouldn't mind going back to that. I, please. So um, if you think about a place of a co public accommodation means an establishment that offers some kind of advantage or benefit, couldn't it be argued that a church or synagogue falls within that category? An establishment, someone, you know, it depends on what your definition might be of a benefit, of an advantage. Can you just say something about that? Sure, I, I think it's a, it's a great thought. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I think, um, uh, uh, an establishment. I have not looked at any case law that um, looks at the term establishment, but um, I think that uh, again, it would be some, you know, uh, and we're going to get to the federal protections, the Americans with Disability Act that comes into play a little bit with um, okay. this chapter, but um, again, spoiler, <laughs> spoiling the next slide, um, the American with Disabilities Act, when it comes to um, protecting folks with disabilities, specifically excludes religious organizations from um, application there. So um, um, when we're looking at all of the other protected classes, um, I think that's an interesting point about a potentially broad definition of establishment. I'm not aware of any case law that has uh, swept a, uh, a church or a synagogue or um, uh, into a, you know, a place of worship into a, a public accommodation. But to Senator Hooker's point, um, again, there's that analysis of to what extent um, are they offering you know, those bingo nights? And is the bingo night then transform it for a small portion of time into a place of public accommodation. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not a straightforward analysis. Senator Chittenden. So I'm thinking of two examples of like a store and a restaurant that are stores and are restaurants, but they are not offered to the general public. Uh, I don't know if I'm not supposed to list uh, specific names, but uh, I do about 90% of my shopping at one that rhymes with Costco and uh, not anybody can just go into Costco, but they are a store uh, that they are not offering to the general public, but I do believe they have to abide by this rule. And I would also say the Victory Club at the University of Vermont men's hockey game, that too is a restricted establishment but is it, is it false for me to think that they all have to abide by these anti-discriminatory rules? And just looking at the wording of this, they are stores and establishments, not open to the general public. Uh, but so are they then exempt from this anti-discriminatory law? So I don't think I can speak to the Victory Club because I'm not familiar with that at all. I am, however, familiar with Hosco. Um, uh, you know, um, Again, the analysis for public accommodation is um, uh, whether the services are open to the general public. Um, and what does that mean to be open to the general public? Anyone can apply for uh, a, a membership card to Costco. Um, there's no, um, there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, people may not financially be able to afford it. Uh, that's really, I think, the only 
the only hang up there is, is money. Um, potentially I'm not aware of any, um, anything on the Costco application, um, that, uh, might fall into a protected class, but I think generally speaking, um, and we'll get into it when we look at a case, uh, that's kind of on point to our discussion today. Um, some of the factors that courts may look at are, um, uh, you know, how selective are organizations in um, their selection criteria. Um, and so, I, you know, I think it's a great practical question. I can't imagine that Costco does not fall under the um, Public Accommodation Act simply because their membership is open to the general public. Um, uh, not a, yeah, I don't know, Jim, if you disagree with me, feel free to speak up. No, I agree with that. That's right, I think. And what is the, what is, can you just say something else about the Victory Club that you belong to? I just, don't, I'm not familiar with it. And it's, well, I do not belong to me it. as an elite thing, but I don't know the details. I, I don't belong to it. I call them the star belly sneeches, but they basically you pay a thousand dollars a year and it allows you to go into this back room at the hockey games where you can buy and consume alcoholic beverages during the breaks. And so it is an establishment and uh, yeah. you can buy things there, but you can only get in uh, if you have a, a membership. Yeah. Um, I think this is important because as I start to understand private schools or religious schools, if they, if any, any kid can apply there, how is yeah. that different than the Costco example? And so if Costco has to abide by these things, I would expect all schools, qualified schools through some certification process to have to abide by these anti-discriminatory rules. I mean, it's interesting. It, it, it really is because you can even think about the Mount St. Joseph example of Anybody can apply. They may not accept you. They might have, uh, you know, certain reason, academic, I, all sorts of things. But um, you, 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 you can apply. Senator Hooker. For instance, I don't believe there's an elevator at MSJ. So does MSJ have to comply with ADA and all of those things being a, a religious? institution no she uh mentioned just that that religious institutions are exempted correct from correct. any kind of ada requirements so then to to senator chittenden's question are they exempted from you know everything i mean that's the that's the million dollar question i think that's what we're trying to talk about here today um and i um thank you if i could just briefly address the Victory Club. Um, yeah. I keep spoiling all of our slides. That's directly on point. Um, okay. Private private clubs is the case law that we have that's related to this in Vermont. And that's exactly um, what I'm gonna talk about in a, another slide. Okay. Private clubs, fraternal organizations. Country clubs, things like yep. that. Yep, okay. Um, there is no case law directly on point to whether a religious school um, would qualify as a public accommodation in Vermont under our Vermont state law. Um, of interest that we've already talked about, but I think is important to point out, there is legislative, uh, there is the, at the start of the um, Vermont Public Accommodations Act in Title IX, there's a whole um, section that is devoted to legislative intent. It's not very long but it states that the um, Vermont Public Accommodations Act is, is intended to implement and be construed so as to be consistent with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and it goes on to say that it, um, the intent is not to um, uh, provide more safeguards than the American with Disabilities Act for uh, with respect to persons with disabilities. So it's narrowing that legislative intent um, uh, to conformance with the American with Disabilities Act, um, specifically to persons with disabilities. But as I've already mentioned, um, any sort of analysis trying to sweep religious schools into an ADA um, analysis um, kind of falls short because the ADA specifically excludes religious organizations uh, from its application. It's not um, case law, it is right there in the law. There's a specific exemption for it there. It's very clear.
So this gets right to the Victory Club, I think, a club that I am not aware of, um, but now know more about. Um, uh, I struggled finding any sort of case law that was clearly on point and helpful to this committee as you begin to think about what work you want to take up and how you want to take up that work. Um, and so uh, there's, there's no case law that I am aware of um, that specifically addresses whether a religious school in Vermont qualifies as a public accommodation. But um, a religious school, if you think about it as a, a, a private organization, uh, in this case, a Human Rights Commission um, versus the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks um, from 2003 is a Vermont Supreme Court case that does address whether a private club like um, the Elks could be covered by the um, Vermont Public Accommodations Act. Um, and the analysis there really hinged on um, how selective the club is in its membership. Just like um, HOSCO, anyone could apply for an application or a membership to the, to the ELKS, um, but it really comes down to the selective criteria used um, in uh, admitting membership. So um, uh, the court, um, essentially it comes down to a, a case by case fact-based analysis of the selectivity of the organization. Um, and in this particular case, the court looked at lots of things from the specific membership requirements, um, the application, the membership process, um, to um, the history of who they had admitted um, and how many applications they had denied in the past. I think um, specifically, and this was, uh, this was a procedural case, it did not decide the ultimate question of whether um, the Elks uh, was a uh, place of public accommodation. There were some procedural issues that were challenged and the case was remanded back um, to the trier of fact who had not made these case by case fact based um, uh, inquiries onto the selectivity of the club to do just that. So this um, case does not um, sort out once and for all that the Elks specifically in this specific case in White River Junction in 2003 um, uh, was a place of public accommodation, but it talked about uh, the analysis that would need to be undertaken in order to make that determination. And it stressed that there really needs to be um, a high level of selectivity um, in order to fall outside of the public accommodations. Um, it's not enough um, for an organization to appear selective on paper. So, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it really, uh, the analysis needs to be both of the selection criteria and its true limits or lack thereof on admission. So it's not enough to just look at what's the application ask for. Um, it, the analysis needs to go deeper and look at, um, I think, history, as well as um, how that analysis is undertaken, how those criteria are used against someone, um, and how selective really is the organization. Uh, so I, I think it, if, if there were to be a challenge to whether a uh, religious school was a place of public accommodation. I, I don't think there would be a blanket application of all school, all religious schools in the state of Vermont fall under the Vermont Public Accommodations Act. Based on this case, um, it's likely that it would be a fact-based, a fact-specific analysis on a school-by-school, case-by-case basis. Any questions before I keep going. Okay. Um, so if, uh, if we don't know for sure whether Vermont uh, religious school, a religious school in Vermont um, has to, is a place of public accommodation and therefore automatically cannot discriminate against those protected classes, um, can we require them to comply with anti-discrimination laws as a condition of receiving public tuition? So we already know um, from Espinosa uh, that the Supreme United States Supreme Court held that the free exercise clause protects religious observers against unequal treatment and against laws that impose special disabilities on the basis of religious status. 
the court held that requiring a school to give up its religious affiliation in order to qualify for public funds would impose, impose special disabilities on the basis of religious status and the violation of the free exercise clause. So requiring that a religious school comply with an anti-discrimination law as a condition of receiving public tuition would mean that the school would not be able to discriminate against protected classes under the VPA, even if the school was not subject to the VPA in employees in employment law, um, which in limited circumstances is permitted under the Supreme Court's interpretation of the, uh, of the free exercise clause. Um, the most recent case that addressed this is Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, but there is a, um, it is a relatively um, uh, strongly held uh, case line that supports the ministry, it's called the ministerial exception, um, which basically um, holds that religious organizations can discriminate against employees if they hold a ministerial role within the organization. And how a ministerial role is defined is not um, 100% percent uh, a black and white analysis that is um, more akin to a fact-based um, case-by-case analysis. For example, if I may, you, <clears throat> I remember there was a situation where you know, a teacher at a religious institution could be considered a minister without what many people would consider the, would have come to be known as traditional credentials, um, a master's in divinity or something like that. Yes. Yes, the case law and, um, you know, if at any point um, there's um, varying lines of case law for everything that Jim and I are talking about today, mm -hmm. we were trying to, you know, keep this kind of broad and, and foundational. Yeah. So if at any point you're interested in more information on any of those lines, please let us know. But for example, Senator Campion, to your point, um, uh, in, in cases that looked at the ministerial exception, they've looked at things like, did the teacher lead the students literally physically walk them to prayer for the day. Mm -hmm. um, things as broad as that, and that's part of the analysis. Thank you. So the question is real, oh, I'm sorry. Is there a question? Sure. Yep, Senator yeah, sure. so I just want to make sure I understood your previous point on selectivity. So did I understand that it, it still needs to be a fact-based analysis, but uh, the court held that the more selective you are, so if you're very selective, it's more likely you do not need to abide by VPAA. Yes, you would not be, your services would not be considered open to the general public and therefore you would not qualify as a place of public accommodation. Um, Thank you. That's, that's helpful. So the million dollar question is whether denying the right of a religious school to discriminate in this fashion, um, whatever fashion um, they believe they, they um, need to, imposes special disabilities on the basis of the school's religious status. Um, you know, Jim talked about uh, whether uh, denying uh, public funds on a, just the status of the religious organization um, was tolerable or whether that was a, a special disability. Um, it's, it's a less requ severe requirement that a school give up its religious affiliation in order to qualify for public tuition, as was the case in Espinoza, but it's still a form of an imposition on the degree of the school's exercise re of religion, at least if these forms of discrimination are required or encouraged by the school's theology or religious mission. Um, it's not clear how either uh, how the Vermont Supreme Court might or the United States Supreme Court might rule on this question, um, which really represents a friction between two constitutional protections, which is the free exercise versus, of religion versus equal protection of the law and protection from discrimination. So this is not a, a well-settled area of the law, um, and there's a lot um, of different pieces moving um, to understand um, and make an educated um, uh, decision on where to go. And that ends my portion. That was great. Questions. So I have one more section to go. I'll just say um, the making case um, 
might give some clarity on this question in June, July, or maybe not. Uh, the court might not go in this area about discrimination uh, and might just simply do the use versus SAS um, analysis or might do something else. But so it's not clear whether this will be addressed by, by the court this summer. Um, okay, next is about dual enrollment. And very briefly, just to say how this connects to this whole conversation. Um, so we've got dual enrollment, which is um, uh, taking a class to both high school and college credit at the same time. And that uh, benefit is available to public school students, approved independent school students on public tuition and homeschool students. It's not available to approved independent school students on private tuition, whether attending a secular or a religious school. Um, so the issue here um, is that students uh, attending religious schools have been denied dual enrollment because they are not on public tuition. So once you make the decision, once the school board, that, that school district says, um, no, Senator Terrazini, you can't use um, public funds for, for tuition at this religious school. Once that happens, it also, also has a knock-on effect of saying, because you're not on public tuition, you don't have dual enrollment benefits. Um, so these are tied in that fashion. Um, so therefore the failure of school districts to make public tuition payments due to SAS, students are also excluded from dual enrollment, which is just said. Um, and then there have been some of the cases in the Ministry of Actions I mentioned earlier have addressed this issue and have ordered uh, that these students uh, be given dual, dual enrollment. So there is um, probably some clarification we need to make, we need, you, you might need to make, sorry, since we, um, on the dual enrollment uh, statute to clarify um, that, that you cannot deny, uh, again, you cannot deny um, public tuition based upon business status, and there, therefore you can't deny dual enrollment based upon religious status. And that is the end of our presentation. In our perch life. Uh, you're muted, Senator. Jim, did you say that there was a decision, court decision on the dual enrollment? I remember there was a lawsuit and I thought I remembered there was a decision, but I wasn't clear since I didn't see one cited there that where they said that Vermont could not deny dual enrollment for those tuition to a religious school. Yep, yeah, that was that was ordered. It was AHV French. There, there are two court cases and there are four state board administrative actions. And at least one of those dealt with dual enrollment. Is that, is that the state Supreme Court? Uh, that's the, the state, um, the, Vermont, the Vermont courts. I don't think it's gone to the state Supreme Court yet. Thank you. Other questions? That was a great presentation, Senator Chittenden. So I recall from the discussion last year uh, that I made the statement and that I think you agreed with, but it, now I think there's some more nuance to it. If we, as the state legislature, just eliminated tuitioning and basically didn't allow um, students to, uh, to, to basically force every residence in this state to have to be assigned to school district and not allow the monies, that would solve part of the problem. But on your last slide, I don't think it would fix the dual enrollment piece that is currently uh, when you say it's not available to approve independent school students paying private tuition. So that would not be, not that I'm advocating for it. So anybody yeah. watching, I'm not advocating to get rid of tuitioning, but just that, that option, that nuclear option of eliminating the tuitioning thing would not fix the concern about the possible state discrimination against private tuition dollars going to the dual enrollment piece. Am I wrong in understanding that distinction? You're correct. Okay, You're you. correct. So you have to amend that statute um, if you wanted to facilitate dual enrollment. Other, other questions? 
So in, in a way, uh, we're in a position where, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Jim, there are really three, maybe four options. There is the do nothing, uh, let things go as they are going until the US Supreme Court comes out with the main case decision in June, which I think, well, whatever that decision might be. The second is to consider uh, the draft that we all kind of worked on last year, which puts some, uh, gives some guidelines to districts um, around what they should be, can be doing at this point, as well as put some uh, barriers around, um, attempts to put some barriers around how public dollars are used with religious institution, as well as gets to um, the anti-discrimination piece. And the third option would be to, uh, and this is one I should say that I know leadership is, has not endorsed, uh, and it is the one that Senator Chittenden mentioned and the one that we have talked about last year, but again, uh, this is the committee where these would be decided. If you did stop all public dollars going to any kind of private institution, no more tuitioning, in other words, you would close that option off, that, that would say, that would allow the state of Vermont to say, okay, no more dollars going then to religious institutions either. Uh, it would, I know there are people out there, uh, just to get everything out on the table a little bit, have talked a little bit about uh, wanting to support that kind of proposal um, which would certainly, in my opinion, disrupt a lot of educational institutions and a lot of children's education at this point. It would also, if you, if people wanted to protect the historical academies, it would require that those historical academies become public schools. In other words, um, and I know Jim and I have talked about this quite a bit, it would be the equivalent of the legislature changing them from independent categories to a category, putting them in the category of public, which would be uh, what is referred to, I think, in, in legal terms as a public taking, which is which is illegal. Um, so it's it's Jim, um, and then of course there's the guidance oh. that we should put around for uh, dual enrollment. Those are sort of the things that I'm when I, in my mind, need to get things summarized in my own brain, that's sort of what I'm, I'm thinking in terms of some of our options. Can I just go back to the, the one? Please. Uh, sorry, so, so in terms of taking um, the private schools and making them public, public takings, uh, of course, happen, but mm -hmm. usually of, of uh, land, you know, to build highways and buildings, you know, but you're talking now about taking private businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole different thing. And the only case I know of is back in 2007 when AIG got taken over by the U.S. government to save the financial system. I mean, it's very unusual. Um, and uh, and in that case, too, that wasn't upheld in terms of the, the taking part of it. Um, that, there was a whole issue around that. Um, so, so I don't think you can just take those four academies back. Um, I'm not sure how, how that could be achieved. Right, right. So in, in that way, it, I just want us to all have that just so that as we're thinking about this, there's there's the reality of some of these decisions. Yeah, Senator Hooker. Thank you. How many schools or how many towns are tuitioning towns? How many school districts? And and approximately on, on average, how many kids are tuitioned each year? Do we have those? I don't have those to hand and those are available um probably best through the um uh no more probably uh we'd be best to testify on that okay certainly if we continue along these lines we'll hear from mr moore okay so i guess one other option jim would be to take the draft that i have which we'll walk through next week and divide it up. You, we could also say there are parts of this that um, we think um, we might want to take on and perhaps 
not others. So, so there are, those are the options I think out there. Um, I'm not asking for us all to take a vote today, but it, it's, it's gonna be something that we're going to have to jump into next week. Um, so as, uh, as much as you can think about it before we do a walkthrough and I'll bring in and give a little testimony next week, just to, again, to give people an additional idea, some additional ideas of what's out there and how we might proceed. But any comments, anything right now, um, any thoughts on how people, what they might be interested in? Senator Chittenden and then Senator Lyons. I'll just say this. I, I think since you're looking for a sense of the committee as one member, I, I don't want public dollars, uh, tax, tax dollars going to schools that breed and foster hate. And so that, that's where my, my line is. And so finding that uh, what Professor Teachout talked about, a certification, uh, any type of process that qualifies a school uh, to meet certain standards, including the VPAA, is where I, I think makes perfect sense. The religious aspect as well, but I think looking at the discrimination piece and having those qualifications before any public dollars can go to is a path that I would support us exploring further because I, I don't want my dollar, I don't want our tax dollars going to schools that foster and, uh, and encourage discrimination against protected classes. Senator Lance. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with my colleague from Chittenden County. Um, the, other, the other question I have is, can we go ahead with uh, passing a bill with provisions in it, regardless of where the court decision is, but add language that's, that sort of says we, this provision will uh, you know, disappear if there's a, a court decision that is contrary to the legislation, is that possible or does that, is that silly to do that? I don't think it's very relevant because that's true okay. always, right? So if, yeah. uh, if a more superior um, uh, decision is made at the federal level, it's going to avoid whatever you've done anyway. Um, okay. For, for, for everything, for any topic that you can think of. So, um, okay. okay. Anything else right now? <clears throat> Senator Terenzini. Uh, thank you, Senator Kimmy. Uh, if you were just sort of asking for poll or opinion of where yeah, we stood, yeah. I, I would generally say, you know, I would I would keep things status quo, but increase uh, the um, uh, or ramp up the process to ensure that these schools are um, uh, inclusive and and accept uh, diversity and 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 so on. So there wasn't ever a as Senator Senator Chittenden said a little more polished than I will, but you know we want to you know, make sure that every child is felt welcomed and accepted and, and loved. And that's what schools are all about. So I'd say keep the program the way it is uh, with some type of insurances uh, that these tax dollars are going to places where, you know, they're inclusive and, and accept diversity. Yeah, helpful. Senator Persley. <clears throat> yeah, likewise. Yeah. And I can't remember, maybe we just ran out of time last year. I can't remember why we didn't do it last year. I thought we were basically at this same position last year, but I, I support that. And, and we'll see what the courts do, but I think we should you know, lead with our values that, that we think this is the way it happens. The courts, especially the current makeup of the US Supreme Court might disagree, but I think we should still pass, pass some kind of restrictions on these public dollars at religious schools. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing up um, where we are as it relates to last year. Um, it's, uh, I think it was kind of a combination of um, running out of time. Uh, I, I had hoped to, in a way, to um, just give people some more thinking, some more time over the summer. It, it just, I think we were also waiting, I could be wrong, to hear those early arguments in the main case um, and that there were some other cases happening and, and just felt as though since we had the time, kind of take the time. Um, I thought it was also because you felt a little guilty running up the score against the other committee chairs because we passed like 10 bills. 
Some committees have difficulty passing I, one or two. No, I think we really did. It was, uh, I think you had a bunch of last minute priorities we needed to get done um, related to HVAC. Um, and so you asked for us to just hold off on everything else. <laughs> yeah. Senator Chinden. Uh, so if I recall the conversation and some guidance from Jim last year, uh, an important distinction to what I think I just heard Senator Perslick say is legislative intent is extremely important in these discussions. And, and for me, my legislative intent as one legislator is not to apply restrictions on religious schools. My, my, my legislative intent is to apply standard certification of, of ensuring that any school, any school, Okay, so that, that, that's the distinction there. Any school that receives public dollars abides by the VPAA with no targeting or specificity to religion. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's worth saying, but I remember that being a sticking point last, last spring. It's helpful. All these comments are really helpful. Senator Hooker, did you want to add something? Just that I agree with that. And I, my only caveat is that there has to be a way of monitoring how this money is being spent and that's that's the sticking point how do you guarantee that the money is being spent correctly yeah yeah you're you're absolutely right it's a great point it's you know once it's sort of like if your parents give you a hundred bucks and say just don't spend it on candy you know if it goes into the whole family budget you know you could you know, it, it gets mixed up, you know, so how do it is sort of the honor policy with this. Um, and what we can look at is, you know, are there ways to you know, help people with this so that people that, again, I would think largely are going to want to do the right thing can do the right thing. And, um, and if they don't, then what is what are the repercussions if they don't? And how do you evaluate that? Those are, those are hard decisions, and some of which could perhaps happen in outside of this committee, but in rules and things like that, perhaps. So, Jim, did you wanna add something else? No. no. Beth, did you wanna add something else? The presentation was terrific. It really was great, really helpful. Um, and I think if anybody has any questions at all uh, in either of the Republican or Democratic caucuses around what this is about, that's a terrific presentation and uh, feel free to, uh, yeah, share it broadly. Um, great. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. So committee, uh, next week we will um, return to uh, a number of topics. Uh, we'll start going through bill walkthroughs so that we hear everyone's um, uh, bills and priorities. We will follow up on uh, what's happening in our schools and with the Department of Health and how we can be helpful. Uh, we're going to jump in a little bit to Senator uh, Terenzini's bill on the Holocaust, and we're going to also connect that um, or on the same day talk a little bit about, about civic education and some of the things that are happening out there around teaching January 6th. Um, and we also will return to this topic and um, in waiting. Uh, you, Daphne sent everybody what Senator Hardy and Representative um, Kornheiser uh, believes to be a good path forward on waiting. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, please do and feel free to email me ideas or comments over the weekend. It's still, um, I think it's still a bit, uh, nothing's been settled. Let me, let me say that. So, um, but we, everybody's uh, going to have to get started. And so if anybody does have any comments on it or suggestions, just let me know. General. I did send you one comment. Do oh, you, you want? Did. Okay. Um, uh, the, the text comment or the? The text. If okay. you would like a further comment, let me know. But I feel very strongly about what I sent. Okay. Okay. Good. Great. Anything else? All right. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Um, thanks for uh, a good week back and uh, talk to you all soon.